Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Great to see you all. It is actually amazing to see so many wonderful, familiar faces. Thank you for having me back this year. Um, I'm going to just make sure my clicker is working. Yes. Um, so this is a TED Talk. However, I can't deliver a TED Talk without first trying to UDLize it a little bit. So I want you to know that you have some options. The goal for this 20, 18 minutes is that we think about UDL. And I've switched the letters. We're going to think first about learning. Then we're going to think about design. And then we're going to think about universal through the perspective of the brain, which is one of my favorite things. And throughout the talk, I'm going to use my hand. Many of you have seen my brain model before that I may have seen some nods that I love to make with my hand. So we all have our own little brain model on our hand that I invite you to use at any point during the conversation today or other times. We have our representation networks in the back, strategic networks in the front, and all in the middle, the entire middle, are your engagement networks. So I'll be referencing that. I hope you stand up, sit under the table, fidget all that you need. I have a recording of this, so if this verbal means of communication is not working for you, I hope you go put some headphones on and listen to the recording. That recording is available, so if you want to have discussions with groups at other points at other times and collaborate, that is available for you. I have a summary. I have. Um, what else do I have? I have um, additional resources if you want to, to learn more. So before we even got started today, I do want to give you some options for the next 18 minutes. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to put up a little inspirational quote and let you do what you need to do to get comfortable. And we'll begin in like five seconds. Is anyone moving around? Someone did get under a table one time. If that's where he did his best learning, that was great. OK. So even before we were born, our brain was like a jumbled blob of connections. And we each started with our own unique blob of connections. And based on how we interact with the world around us, that blob began to get sculpted in very unique ways. So take, for example, the first time you experienced a dog. How many of you have experienced a dog? Yes? OK, good, good. Perhaps it came up to you, gave you a lick, gave you a smell. Your brain began, your jumbled blob of connections began to form um, connections based on that experience, based on that interaction with the dog and the environment. So your perception network started to perceive the roughness of its tongue, the wag of its tail, the softness of its fur. You may have started to associate the English word dog that the owner may have used in connection with that dog. Your strategic networks began to understand and construct an understanding of how to interact with the dog. You can play catch with him. You can, you can pet him. You can feed him. And importantly, your engagement network started to construct an understanding about how you feel about that dog. Is this good for me or bad for me? Perhaps your heart rate elevated a little bit. And you started to get a little shot of dopamine. And you said, you know what? This experience of dog is good, and I'm going to learn to label it as happy. This is happy. So our emotions are constructed in the same way as our concepts and our language. So initially, you didn't have a whole lot of experience with dogs. So the next time you saw another furry, four-legged creature with a tail, such as a cat, you may have tried to play catch with it. You may have tried to pet it. And when it meowed and licked its fur and snubbed you and walked away, you started to then construct another understanding of this new creature in the environment. You started to label it cat. So over time, and with more experience, you began to gain new understandings of your environment, and your brain literally started to construct more nuanced expert understandings, more nuanced and expert neural networks based on your interaction with the environment. And so what this means is that our interactions with the external world influence your, influences your internal biology. We're not isolated. We're constantly interacting with the environment. And that's constructing neural networks that become more efficient and more connected with use and over time. And one of the most remarkable things that brain science has shown us is it uses all of our brain. 
You don't see just a right hemisphere being used. You don't see just a particular learning style or mode being used, but your entire brain is being used. And it's a really unique combination of nature and nurture. So the first time I experienced a dog, I was pushed over and frantic parents ran over and said, oh, are you okay, are you okay? So every experience that we have in our environment starts to construct our neural networks. So that's the learning piece. <laughs> now to kind of shift to the classroom. Before our students even enter our classrooms, they've had years already of constructing their neural networks based on their experiences in their environments. Whether it's reading, writing, drawing, learning how to play fairly, they have already started con to construct their neural networks based on those interactions and what they're perceiving, what they're doing, and how they're engaging. And I have to wonder, as our students enter pre-kindergarten or whatever age they enter, how is the design of our environment going to begin to influence those neural networks? Because our older students have had years of experiences in our systems. And I have to ask myself, what are the stories that their brains are constructing based on the interactions that they're having with us in our environments? Are those stories of engagement, of high expectations, where they're empowered to make learning choices as part of the community? Or are they about being compliant? Are they about having a fixed label that may have a stereotype connected with it? Is it about disengagement? What are the stories that they have learned through our design? This is an assignment that I saw, um, and it was intended for high school students who were incarcerated and they were taking a biology class to try to keep up with their academics. And I ask you, so this assignment, it says, how many small words can you find in the word deoxyribonucleic acid, which is DNA? So this was a science lesson. And so I ask you, what are the expectations of the learning by design? Are these high expectations? Are they being challenged to learn to think like scientists? Every moment is an opportunity for us to design for learning. Carol Dweck, who most of us know through her work on, um, on mindset, and her book I think is called Mind Shift, um, she describes how when she was in school back in the 60s, she was seated by order of IQ. And she was always wondering how her actions that got a reaction, good. <laughs> See, I've practiced this talk so much, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that. Yes, right? A little shocking. Actually, I'm really happy you're all shocked because, because <laughs> I'm gonna challenge you. How do we currently seat our students in our classes right now? I so frequently hear, oh, this group is my level one group. This station is my gifted station. They're gonna do something different. These students are going to go down the hall to be able to access that. How are we still seating and grouping and labeling our learners? And what are those expectations that we're giving them through our design? How are they perceiving them? How are they interacting with them? How are they engaging in those moments? Because this subtle, but I have to say it's often very overt language and design matters and makes an incredible difference. Some of you may also remember this 1968 study that was done by Jane Elliott after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. She assigned, uh, she came in one day and she told all the students with brown eyes um, that she had them wear a little patch and she said, you're going to sit together and you're not as smart as the blue-eyed students. How many of you remember that study? Yeah, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's uh, linked in the, in the notes section. Um, so in one day, she did this just for one day and then she switched it so the blue-eyed students also had a turn feeling this. But in one day, she saw differences in students' body language, in their behaviors, in their motivation, and in their cognitive abilities. In one day, the way that she, her subtle language and the way she designed and seated those students started to have an impact on their cognition. It impacted what they perceived, 
how they behaved, and how they engaged in that environment. What happens to students who have been labeled in a system for years? This was one day. What's the impact on their neurobiology by our design? Now, I'm not saying all of this to overwhelm you, <laughs> because teaching is unbelievable emotional work. Just like learning, teaching is emotional work. But I'm sharing these examples to be provocative and to really challenge you to think that even in a small moment, like a little worksheet, or how you seat your students, what is that design saying to your students? How is that design supporting your core values about what you think and believe learning can be? So I'm happy that Joni mentioned the myth of the average because I have a little brain picture to support it. Um, so recently, I, I heard the story of a little boy who was reading six months behind average is what the parents said. And of course, immediately I was like, oh, average. OK, what do we know about the average? We know that it's a myth. So if you take a look at the circled brain, that's the average brain, and then you take a look at all the individuals, you can see the average matches no one. So he is basically six months behind a mythological no one, right? <laughs> and what happened to this kiddo was that he was tested, he was labeled, and he is now removed from the classroom every day to work on his reading skills. As learning is first and foremost emotional, what is this design saying to this student? UDL offers us a paradigm shift in how we approach the design of our learning environments. It works to put the label of disability or ability on the design of the environment, not on the student. It works to build a language. I know that that framework looks overwhelming, but in it, it provides a language of learning that we can use with our students because that language focus, it's an asset-based model where it can let, allow students to build on their strengths and to grow their skills so that they began, begin to gain more autonomy over their own learning process. Because when we're designing with UDL, and here you can see a nice picture model that aligns to my very rough fist model, when we design with UDL, we are designing to support our perceptual networks, our strategic networks, and our affective networks that are all in the middle. So when we design thinking about UDL, we are designing to support the learning brain, much in the same way that we talked about with dog, but I recognize what you're teaching is a little more complicated than dog. You're working to really you know, help students understand the wonders of the universe and the archaeological past, but that process of learning is the same, and the core foundation of how we design should support neurologically what we know happens in the learning brain. So in my job at CAST, we get asked this question all the time. What does UDL look like? So I thought in less than 70 words, because I tend to ramble, so it's hard for me to limit it, in less than 70 words, I'm going to tell you what UDL looks like. This is what you will see in any UDL environment. First, you will see a clear learning target. Learners know what the goal. The goal is the center and focus. It's very clear. And variability is valued through the way that we design our environment. And we think about that design in terms of engagement, representation, and action, and expression. And if you focus on some of the subtle language, I'm going to call out just a few of the checkpoints, because the language is, is big. It was written by researchers, but it's so subtly beautiful. We're thinking about choice and autonomy. We're thinking about authenticity and relevance. We're thinking about how we're fostering collaboration and we're holding learners to high expectations. This language sounds like, you know, I'm coming up with this amazing pedagogical theory. It's all there in the UDL guidelines. It's, um, it's so um, then I'll go through representation a little. We make sure that our learners can perceive the information, that the language is in a language that they can understand, uh, and that they're able ultimately to comprehend and transfer their learning, not just in our learning environment, but outside of the classroom as well. 
And ultimately, we want everyone to be able to demonstrate what they know, that they can express in their most um, successful ways, and that they're able to monitor their progress and demonstrate strong executive skills, executive function skills. These are expert learners. These are the subtle pieces, the beauty of the language that's in the UDL framework. This is the first year that the co-founder of CAST and co-author of the UDL guidelines is not at the, at the IRN summit. So co-founder David Rose um, was actually brilliant for how he transformed stories of learning. When he first graduated with his education degree, he advocated to be placed with the most challenging, the hardest to reach, the most disengaged students. Because he knew every student can learn, he worked to remove barriers in the environment. He held high expectations for all his learners, and he put engagement first. Now, he taught a set Shakespeare curriculum that he had to teach. And in that curriculum, he brought it to life by having students act it out, by having them analyze films, by having them translate the language of Shakespeare so that it was meaningful for them. And in that one year, he overturned the stories of disengagement and of being challenging, troubled students. In one year, he overturned those, um, those stories, not only for the administrators and the teachers and for the other students who had those expectations of those students, but for those students themselves. So I'm going to pause for a moment and ask you to reflect on how does David's story make you feel? I'm gonna pause for about 15 seconds for you to reflect. How does David's story make you feel? So we describe learning as being about this interaction with the environment. And a lot of UDL focuses on perception, action, and engagement. But I also want to highlight some networks that are active in the brain that are really deep, that I actually have a hard time showing you on my little fist model because they're kind of in my wrist in here. And these are known as the default mode networks. I know I'm going to work on getting some contraption. but um, So the default mode networks are active when we take time for quiet reflection. And they activate some areas in here that are the anterior insula, which monitors our gut and the brain stem, which monitors our breath, and it actually monitors our gag reflex. And there's a tiny little point down at the bottom that's called the medulla. It's all the way down in your brain stem. It literally keeps you alive, it keeps your heart beating. So when we take time to reflect on how something or someone makes us feel, it activates circuits in our brain that literally keep us alive. And I don't know about you, but that blew me away. Because this is building a really important social emotional skill of empathy that I would argue is one of the most important that we can teach our learners today. So not only am I encouraging you to design with the UDL guidelines, thinking about this active learning, but I'm also going to challenge you to design moments of quiet reflection so that we are able to also scaffold the development of these networks that are essential for us for gaining empathy for other people. Because we're not isolated brains. We're embodied and we're situated in an environment that is constantly co-constructing our biology. It's really important. So no matter how small the moment, I challenge you to ask, what is the story this design is telling my learners? The core values of UDL are challenging us to have high expectations, to value variability, to look to engage first, to have those moments of quiet reflection, and to focus on changing the environment, not the learner. So what if we take this eight-year-old boy who is described as being six months below reading average, what if we instead provided lots of choice of engaging materials for this student to read? with options for him to collaborate and read with his peers or with a teacher or with an aide or on his own? If we provided digital materials that would help him access the content? What if we provided options for him to progress monitor and chunk his reading? What if we made this design available for all learners in the environment from the beginning? What would the design of that environment convey to that learner? 
So the last of the cast founders have all retired in the past year, but they've left with us this tool, the UDL guidelines, that can inspire us to change the way we design our environments. Because you know what? This is our time. This is our opportunity to innovate learning for all. Thank you very much. Thank you.